Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, even in this moment, as we have lifted your name and we praise you and we celebrate you and we honor you, God, we just stop to say you're so good. You're so gracious. You're so loving. You're so merciful. God, you're just so good. And God, we gather here today because we understand if it hadn't been for you on our side, where would we be? So God, even as we sit here and we've worshiped and we've praised together, God, we ask in this moment that you give us ears to hear what you have to say from heaven. You give us eyes to see you in the word, God. You give us hearts that'll respond to it, hands that'll go to work and feet that'll walk it out. God, we don't wanna just be hearers of the word, we wanna be doers. So today, God, we ask that you write this word on our heart and may we never, ever be the same in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. I'm gonna be reading to you today from Mark 1. Mark 1, verse 1, and it reads, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah, the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Verse nine, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately, say immediately, he saw the heavens being torn open and the spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. The spirit immediately, say immediately, drove him out into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan and he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. As you're taking your seat today, I'm gonna talk to you about the declaration of deliverance. Declaration of deliverance. Take your seat, take us your seat. Just a little background about the book of Mark. It's the shortest of the four gospels, but it's a fast paced book. You know, it doesn't include the genealogy of Jesus. It doesn't lead and include all the events that lead up to his ministry. It gets straight to the nitty gritty. It opens up with Jesus's baptism and it closes with his death and resurrection about three years later. So what we find here in this chapter, Mark 16 chapters, we see Jesus's arrival, but we also see his departure. And so when we open up today in the book of Mark, it takes us straight to John the Baptist, preparing the way for Jesus. And see, back in John's day, it was important. If someone important, a VIP was coming to town, they would send a herald or a messenger to let them know someone was coming. So it lets us know that the, the people of that day, those officials wouldn't have been interested in Jesus had a herald not been sent ahead to let them know someone was coming. So when we open up the book of Mark, we see John preparing the way for Jesus's arrival. And what you have to know is that John is like the first genuine prophet in 400 years. There's been silence. You have the Old Testament prophets and then it goes silent. And so after 400 years, now we have John the Baptist on the scene and he's introducing them to a new way to connect to God, a new way to relate to God. So when you study this book out and it talks about a baptism, that's the visible sign that a person had decided to change their lives and turn to God. So this baptism is very significant. Think about 400 years of hearing nothing, and then you hear a little something, something, and you see something. So the dots are being connected from the Old Testament prophets to the New Testament, which brings me to my first point. You know, the preparation for Jesus was the declaration of repentance. That was the declaration of repentance. John is preparing the way for people to receive the message that you are a sinner. 
the message that you have sin in your life, the message that you need to turn from your sins. And so what's happening is he's starting on the front end of this story, letting them know that the process is shifting and that there's a thing you need to go through, a process you need to go to, go through to walk into redemption and freedom. So what we see is Jesus comes to John the Baptist to be, re- to be baptized, not because he was a sinner, but because of the one who sent him. I want you to learn a little bit because so often people will take stuff out of context and then they try to make Jesus think and act like we act instead of realizing he's fully God and fully man sent by the Father to the earth with an assignment. And we need to understand what he was sent here to do. So he was on this assignment and Isaiah told it, the prophets told it, that he would come, somebody was going to prepare the way. So what's happening here is there's a fulfillment of all the Old Testament coming into place. So when you think about this, he's coming because there's a much bigger picture going on. I want you to stay with me for a moment because I got to give you this background. Because so often we want to get happy and get to shout and get to the cross, but Jesus had to walk through the way. We want to just think we get to skip all the hard stuff and get to show up one day and everything's wonderful, but that's not what happened to Jesus and it's not what's going to happen to us. So I want to walk through this test and text and take my time so you can see what Jesus put on display for us. When we see what Jesus went through, it'll help us stop whining so much about what we go through. It'll help us stop complaining so much when things get hard. Jesus is teaching us in this text how we walk through a little something, something. walk through it to get to we don't get to jump up and get over so I want you to follow this text when you look at verses 9 through 11 the baptism of Jesus was a declaration of sonship he's showing who he is he's identified right in this text with sinful humanity In his baptism, Jesus joined those who seek a baptism of repentance. But like I said, he's not repenting. He's not confessing. He's aligning himself with the ones he was sent to save. He's aligning himself. Verse 10, when you think about this, you know, Jesus' baptism demonstrated his approval by the Father. God is a God of order. He's showing us something here. He's putting the points and the steps together. When you look at verse 10, it says, And when he came out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. I had you repeat the word immediately because as soon as he comes up, the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus through the opening of the sky. And Jesus sees the heavens being torn open. This word torn is so important because it only appears in the Bible twice. It appears at Jesus' baptism and it appears at the, when he has been crucified. So two times in the Bible we see where, where God supernaturally intervenes and acts and does a visible sign of who this is. So what's happening is God is showing his approval of Jesus through action. What I want to also point out in verses 9 through 11, we see the triune God. See, the word Trinity ain't in the Bible, and a lot of other religions want to come and fight with you about that. I don't have to see the word Trinity written because I see it right here visible. Because you got God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Ghost all in appearance right here in this text. You see the Son being baptized, the Father is speaking, and the Spirit is descending. That is your Trinity. You see them all together. And what's happening is Mark is giving us a glimpse into the nature of God. All three in one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And again, this is confirming the identity of Jesus. Hang with me, I'm getting somewhere, y'all, because we need to see what God is doing in this text, what he's doing with Jesus and what he's done with us. When you look at verse 11, it says, And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, and I'm well pleased. So often people skip over this, but this is one of the most important verses in the whole Bible. One of the most important verses. Why? Because no prophet had ever been called a beloved son. Abraham was a friend. Moses was a servant. Aaron was chosen. David was a man after God's own heart. But Jesus was the only beloved son. So this is confirming the sonship of who he was and who sent him. God is saying, wait a minute, this is the Messiah that I told you would come. This is my delight. And I've sent him to you and he's on a God assignment and I approve of him before he's ever done any miracle. He hadn't done anything yet, but be. 
He just showed up on the scene in his assignment and God said he was pleased. So he's putting his signature all over him before he says or does anything. He's shutting down the mouths of the naysayers who want to question who he is. Jesus hadn't said anything. He was just on assignment. The verse 12 is where this text gets good. Immediately after this declaration, the narrative shifts and Satan shows up on the scene. Verse, thir- verse 12 says, the spirit immediately drove him into the wilderness and he was in the wilderness 40 days being what? Tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. I want us to walk through this walk of what happens with Jesus so we can get a better understanding of what's going on with us. See, before we talk about this temptation, let's talk about the wilderness. Why the wilderness? Why the wilderness? Because if you remember in the Old Testament, that's the place where God would meet with his people. Isn't that the place where you think about the Exodus and when he brought his children out of Egypt and they went into the wilderness, that's where he gave them the law. That's where he fed them. That's where he led them by clouds and why he led them by fire. The wilderness wasn't an accident. Has God ever met you in the wilderness? Or just me? Like my marriage, my money, my mind. Something about God meeting his people in the wilderness. You know, when you go a little bit deeper, this is where this is the part of this text that we show up. See, we read through that and we talk about God and we talk about Jesus and we're like, oh yeah, that's so good. But you up in here. This wasn't just a coincidence as I heard Kyle talking about, Pastor Kyle talking about Jesus making, I mean, God literally taking Adam and then making a woman because he knew he, I want us to see us in this text. See, when you look at the temptation of Jesus, it was a declaration of war. It was a declaration of war. When God commissions us, it's often followed by a time of testing. It's often followed by a test. The enemy took this test a little bit further and he literally declared war on Jesus right here in the wilderness. Christ literally enters into combat for eternal souls and mankind right here in the text. How does this happen? Because when you look at this thing, Jesus was submissive to the spirit. I want you to see verse 12. He didn't go into the wilderness. The verse said the spirit drove him. He didn't just wake up and decide to go. The spirit drove him because this was a divine appointment that God had set for him before he showed up. This was the divine appointment. This is what, think about it. This is not what we would have expected to happen after a glorious celebration and God saying, this is my son. We would have, we would expected a party. We would expected angels rejoicing. We would not have expected the spirit to lead him into the, to, to the wilderness. We would have not looked for that, but instead what we see here is that the spirit drove him to this place and then the enemy literally shows up. What I want us to realize here is that Jesus yielded to the spirit and he embraces this text because there's a job for us to do. There's a job for him to do. See, the lesson is in our wilderness experiences, see, we want to act like it was a oops and we just showed up there. Jesus didn't just show up in the wilderness. You don't just show up in the wilderness. When we get there, it was either God ordained or God allowed, but God was in it. He either allowed it or ordained it. So let's stop giving all the credit to the enemy. The devil didn't make you do it. You just chose to be disobedient. You chose the way of the world. Jesus, verse 13, is important because Jesus was engaged by Satan. This gives us a snapshot, y'all, into what this battle looked like. He was in the wilderness, verse 13 reads, he was in the wilderness 40 days being tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild animals and the angels were ministering to him. This is important because he was in the wilderness, not on vacation. He was tired. He was in a weakened state. He was fully God and fully man, but he was tired. The human part of him was real. The wilderness part of him was real. And when you think about verse 13, this is so good because we have to see this. If you don't see this, the enemy will make you think you're the only one who go through. 
The enemy will make you think nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my trouble. The enemy will have you out here singing the blues, having a pity party of one, not realizing it's part of the process. When you look at Jesus right here in this text on verse 13, I wish they could put it on the screen. I want us to see that this was a difficult meeting for him because he's in the wilderness, not a garden. He's been fasting for 40 days, so he's hungry. He's alone. He doesn't have his brothers and his sisters with him to encourage him. He's alone. And he's surrounded by wild animals. The Bible said surrounded by, he won't at a park. He was surrounded by wild animals. This testing for Jesus took place in a dry, desolate, dangerous place. So when we look at this and we think about this today, Jesus is showing us how to walk through dark, wild, and uncomfortable places. He's showing us how we're supposed to do it. We're supposed to do it differently than the world. We're supposed to be a contrast to the world. And he's showing us step by step in this text how we do it. Because I don't see yet where he's complained. I don't hear him saying, why me, why me? Why this, why this? Maybe I didn't read it all. But did anybody see in the text where he literally just said, okay, God, this ain't what I signed up for. This ain't what we talked about. In the text, I don't even hear him speak. Why? Because he know who sent him and he know why he sent him and he stayed on mission. He understood that the wilderness and the wild animals and whatever the circumstances didn't get the final say. As long as he stayed faithful to the post that God had given him, he couldn't lose. The animals couldn't take him out. The devil couldn't take him out. He knew why he was there. He knew why he was there. The wilderness test for Jesus was a declaration of suffering. This got me, and when I was talking about this, my husband was the one who pointed out how he, you don't think about it like this. We read this text, we read it in all the gospels, but I had missed this. And we talked about how God just, this right here was powerful. And if we could figure out how to bring it into our lives and walk this thing out, it would change everything. I said the wilderness test was a, for Jesus was the declaration of suffering because the enemy wanted to defeat the Son of God, and he thought this was his chance. I want you to pull up close for a minute, and I want you to listen. I need you to let this sink in. Because people think Satan's goal was to kill Jesus. No, Satan's goal was to get Jesus not to suffer. Satan was at the baptism. He heard it all. He heard it. He knew that the suffering and death of Jesus would mean his doom and destruction, and it would mean salvation for you and salvation for me. He said, if I can get him to avoid the suffering, I can take out mankind. So the whole goal was to avoid the suffering. So what we need to realize when we read this text is that we were at stake in the war of the wilderness. This war wasn't about Jesus and the enemy. This war was about me. This war was about you. This war was about us. If Jesus had refused to suffer, there would have been no cross. If there wouldn't have been no cross, there wouldn't have been no redemption. If there wouldn't have been any redemption, there wouldn't have been any victory. The whole goal was to keep Jesus from suffering. Satan wanted Jesus to bypass suffering so he could sift us like wheat. What would be our defense if there was no Jesus? What would be our way of escape if there was no Jesus? What would be our hope if there was no Jesus? Who would be the lifter of our heads if there was no Jesus? And what we need to understand is the enemy uses the same tactics on us. He uses the same. If I can get you to avoid suffering, if I can get you to avoid going through, if I can get you in your mind so you don't do what you got to do to walk through the promise, if I can get you to choose your feelings over faith, I can get you to choose selfishness over sacrifice, if I can get you to choose comfort over crying out, if I can get you to choose the easy way out over enduring, then I got you in your promise. I got you and your children. I got your marriage and your money. If I can get, if I can get you to avoid going through, if I can get you to avoid pressing on, if I can get you to cut a corner. See, we the people of God, we want to be comfortable. We want convenience. But what Jesus is teaching us here is you got to go through. You got to go through. You can't get to what he has for you if you're not willing to 
just suffer through the process. Now I'm taking my time walking through these verses because we got to get this. I'm so tired of whiny Christians. I apologize, Pastor G, but I mean it. I mean, I don't any, you know, you, you've been saved since Moses and want to have coffee with me and talk about, I just don't know how I'm going to make it. Do you got the Holy Ghost, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, dwells on the inside of you? You better lift up your head and say, weeping may endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. I might be going through, but this thing ain't over until God says it's over. You got to know that suffering is part of the process. Wilderness is part of the process. But you got to make up your mind like Jesus. I ain't coming off my post. I'm not, not, not going to finish my assignment. Quitting ain't an option once you've decided to win. Once you've made up your mind that I'm a winner, that I'm more than a conqueror, no weapon formed against me is going to prosper. Once you know that you know that you know. Doesn't matter what the weapon is, I win. Doesn't matter what the weapon is, you win. What we have to realize in this, in this text is Jesus is showing us how to pass the test. I don't know who told us we could go to kingdom school and I had no test. But see, the kingdom of God ain't like the school system. You know, the school system say no child left behind, so they push you forward. In the kingdom of God, repeat. kids get promoted with all ease on their report card and they think it's in their best interest that they go forward. What, do, what type of English is that? But now with God, he said, do over. Do over. Do over. Jesus ended phase one of this war in Mark 1 when he passed the test. But then we got to keep reading because he ended phase two at the cross. He ended phase two. And what happened is when he said it's finished and the, you know, we think we got an empty grave to prove all of this, he sat down next to the father and then he released us to stand up. See, people want to think that Jesus is finished means yours is finished. No, that means you getting started. He finished so you could start. He finished so you could stand. And what happens when he sat down next to the Father and then he gave us the, the Holy Ghost to stand up, what he did is he released, uh, he released us for an army. He released us to be his army. And every day in this army, as we look at what we've read in Mark, we have to suit up. We have to suit up. You know, Ephesians tells us about putting on the whole armor of God. Some of y'all naked. you ain't dressed you can't wear your worldly clothes to do warfare with the enemy if you can't use worldly weapons you know you can't use worldly clothes you gotta put on your armor you gotta put on your health and a salvation and you gotta realize wait a minute I got the mind of Christ depression you gotta go anxiety you gotta go worry you gotta go you can't stay here you trust You got to guard your inner parts. That means your heart can't be filled with unforgiveness. You can't be walking around here hateful and mad at the world. You need to get dressed. And then you got to put on that belt of truth. And you think about this. You got to literally let what God says about you and who God says you are hold you together. When I pull up my boat belt and I'm tightening something up, I'm holding it together. You got to let your identity in Jesus be the thing that holds you together. When you're and life ain't fair and it don't look right and it don't feel right. You tighten up your belt and says, greater is he that's in me than he that's in this world. You tighten up your belt and you say, wait a minute. Wait a minute, what does God say about this thing? What does the truth say about this thing? 
thing. What does the word say about this thing? You better learn how to tighten up your belt. We want to talk about the young men with they saggy pants. Some Christians got saggy pants. You know, as believers, we got to get to the place in God that we're showing up. We're suiting up and we're speaking up. We're speaking up. Mark told us that Jesus had to fight. And guess what? You got to fight. You got to fight. But the blessing is we need to understand that we're fighting a fixed fight of faith. It's a fixed fight and you cannot lose. And sometimes you got to fight wounded. But you still got to fight. Sometimes you got to fight tired. But you still got to fight. You don't get to pass and say, I'm going to sit this one out. This ain't T-ball. You got to show up. You got to fight. Now, we just talked about how these declarations, we, everybody want to walk in deliverance, but we don't want to make the declarations required. And I'm not just talking about the declarations out of your mouth. I'm talking about the declarations with your life. Because there's a whole lot of people speaking Christianese that ain't living it. And you can say, how can you say that? Ain't no fruit on the tree. I don't need to judge folk. I don't need to judge folks. I just need to be a fruit inspector. If I look at the tree and it ain't no fruit, I don't have to judge that. We need to remember that the preparation for Jesus was the declaration of repentance. The baptism of Jesus was a declaration of sonship. The temptation of Jesus was a declaration of war. The wilderness test for Jesus was a declaration of suffering. And lastly, and then I'm done, the finished work of Jesus was a declaration of our rights. It was a declaration of our rights. You know, today our country celebrates freedom and some people celebrated on Juneteenth and some people celebrated today and I ain't here to fuss with you about none of that. But here's what I want to remind you is that a Christian, I get to celebrate freedom every day. I don't need a date on the calendar. I don't need nobody's permission. I got free when I said yes to Jesus. That's my freedom day. And so that's the day that we need to remember. But as I was preparing for today's message, you know, I wanted to, to talk about something about freedom. And I was looking through, old, I told Trish, uh, Minister Trishonda this, I had this text that I wanted to teach on today because it just seemed really fitting for the, the holiday. And I was studying it out and the Lord stopped me right in the middle of my study. And he says, why are you studying that? I'm like, I think it's proper fitting. You know, it's 4th of July. He said, why do you need a 4th of July message? He said, the gospel is the message every day. He said, so don't be changing up. Go back to what I originally gave you and talk about it. He says, because people need to understand what freedom is. See, sometimes people think freedom means they ain't got no problems. That ain't reality. Because my Bible says, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but God. And I've told you guys already, ain't nothing like a big Bible but. Because when that butt shows up, something get knocked out. So problems come, but through the power of God, they get knocked out. So you need to understand, freedom doesn't mean I don't have any problems. Freedom doesn't mean I don't go through anything. Isaiah 61 says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to build up the broken heart and to proclaim liberty to the captives. This whole message is about reminding you that Jesus went to war for us. He fought for our victory. He fought for our freedom. He came to free us from death, sin, and anything that attempts to enslave us. He finished his part of the war and he defeated Satan. And then he gave us the Holy Ghost. And he gave us the Holy Ghost so that he could equip us for the warfare we would have to keep what he gave us. So many people think that we have to go get it. You already got it. You already got it. 
The question is, are you bold enough to declare war on everything that's attempting to block your freedom, on everything attempting to enslave you? I'm just wondering, where are my Christian warriors at? Where are the people who are ready to declare war on the things that's literally trying to keep them bound? Where are the Christian warriors at, ready to, hold up, be like the children and thinking about the Jericho wall that are ready to let out some shouts and declare war? Wait a minute, because yes, Jesus, he, he won the war when he was dealing with them in the wilderness. He won the war when he, part two of the war, at the cross. But then, guys, do we not, do we think it's over? This thing ain't fully over till you come back and get us. So until then, we still got to fight. Until then, we still got to open up our mouths and we got to declare some war over some things. Only you can declare war over unbelief and fear. Only you can declare war over pride and selfishness, idolatry and worldliness, legalism and man's religion, ignorance and complacency, lack and laziness. And this is one, just keep looking forward and won't nobody know I'm talking about you. The one I like to call excusitis. Because there's a whole lot of us got a couple cases of excusitis. You know, people talk about got the itis in their knee and the itis in their hip. Some of us got the itis in our walk. Because we refuse to declare what God says for us, so then what we do is we settle for living in less than. We refuse to declare the promise and refuse to declare the victory, refuse to declare that, wait a minute, my flesh needs to be crucified, that I can do what God has called me to do through the strength of God. I declare that, wait a minute, my mind's not gonna get the best of me. You know, you just got to get to a place as we read this text on what Jesus did where you are really understanding, I got to declare war. Every day I got to declare war for my life, for my children, for my family. The enemy works overtime to keep our mouths shut. He wants us so distracted and frustrated and so busy that we don't have the energy to fight. He wants us to live like victims instead of victors. He knows if we ever got wind of the fact of why Jesus came, who Jesus was and what Jesus did, then just maybe we'd start living like conquerors. Then just maybe we would pursue the God-ordained purpose and destiny. If he keeps us distracted, his purpose and destiny don't even matter because I'm just trying to get by. So we settle for me and my 4 okay when God is calling you to so much more. When you don't, when you're so busy just doing life and trying to survive instead of thrive, you don't realize you have authority and kingdom benefits. So that's almost living like a pauper when you got a palace. You know, when I think about benefits, I think about how crazy would it be to have dental insurance but then walk around with two teeth in your mouth? You got dip, you have full blown, how crazy is that? To have insurance that'll give you a new set of 32s, but you good with just two. I ain't mad at you two, but if you got insurance to get 30 to make a set, food would probably taste a whole lot better if you could chew it. But see, that's what, I'm just saying, but that's what we're doing as Christians, trying to make them two work. Living off applesauce and you can have a ribeye. I'm just saying, you know, try to make that too. You got these two right here clinking together. How are you going to partake at a table at the feast that God has provided for you? When we look at our text today, verse 13 closes out with Jesus in the wilderness. But the book of Mark closes out in chapter 16 with the resurrection of Jesus. And the last verse in, in Mark chapter 16 tells them that the Lord was with them, working with them, and there were signs. So we opened it up, but there were signs. Signs that should follow those that believe. So my question to you today as we shut this down, you know, do you have signs in your life of a personal relationship with Jesus? There should be signs. You know, absence of suffering isn't a sign. How you go through the suffering is a sign. 
who your hope is in is the sign. Are there signs that you have a relationship? Are there, are there signs that you drifted from the one you say saved you? And somehow or another, you've allowed yourself to become king or queen on your heart. Or you've made you and what you want an idol. My agenda is what I want. Are there signs? You know, today can be a true day of freedom. God still sets captives free. That's why he came. That's why he came. And the God kind of life is still available to anybody who chooses to believe. I want you to close your eyes. Even those who are watching online. I want you to think about the, these declarations for deliverance. And just really, really take a moment and say, God, are there areas in my life that I'm bound? Am I bound to darkness? Because I have never professed you as Lord and Savior. Am I, I bound to the ways of this world because I've never surrendered? Maybe I called you Savior, but I never called you Lord. I want you to just search your heart today. This isn't about the people around you. This isn't about who's looking. But we looked at Mark 1 and through the end and Jesus showed us what to do and how to do it. But the first thing is if you don't have a relationship with him, you can't do it in his might and in his power without him. So the first thing is you need him. So if you're in this building and you've never made him Lord and Savior, if you're online and you never made him Lord and Savior, today can be a day of freedom. If you're online, I need you to type, I choose Jesus today. If you're in this building, then I'm asking that you just be bold in your faith and walk up here. Somebody will meet you. Let us pray with you. Let us walk with you into the relationship that changes everything. Maybe you're here or online and you've drifted from your first love. At one time you walked with them, at one time you talked with them, but somehow or another you lost your way and you need prayer. You wanna come back to Jesus. You wanna come back to your refuge. You wanna come back to your safe place. Then I challenge you to, to type in the, in the chat, no more drifting for me. No more drifting for me. We have a team that'll pray with you. Or if you just need prayer, there's an icon. Hit prayer. We have someone that'll follow up and pray with you. You don't have to walk through this alone. That's the thing I love about Jesus. When we talk about suffering, we don't have to do it alone. He gave us the Holy Ghost and he gave us one another. So if the enemy has taken you into a wilderness, and you're isolated, surrounded by wild animals, and you're hungry for truth, today can be the day that everything changes. And just like angels minister to Jesus, guess what? They will minister to you. And he'll even send some earthly angels to walk with you through that. Do you need a church home? Word tab is great ground. Just hit that icon. Get planted. You don't have to be alone. You don't have to do this alone. I want to just take a moment for us to allow the Holy Spirit to move and to speak to us. If you're in this room, all the eyes are closed, nobody's looking around but me, and you've just drifted, I just want you to wave your hand as a, as a sign of accountability. I've drifted. I need to find my way back. I see those hands. I applaud your boldness. I want to include you in our closing prayer. I see those hands going up. Hallelujah. If you're here and you don't know Jesus, just wave your hand at me in this moment. We don't want anyone to leave here without a relationship. Hallelujah. I see those hands. You can put them down. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. The first declaration that I mentioned today was repentance. I want us to take a moment before we close out in prayer. This is a great opportunity to repent of some of the sins that you've been battling and dealing with. The presence of the Lord is here. 
This is a good time to come clean. To come clean before the sun. Recognize he warred on your behalf. He suffered for you. And then he gave you rights. Just come clean. Talk to your father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. want to worship you and we just want to thank you for what you've done today for revealing yourself to us in ways we might have missed but then planting your truth deep in our souls God we declare that we were receptive soil and that our harvest is coming forth God we we praise you and thank you for everyone who declared today is the day they came home Prodigals coming home to serve you and to, to live lives that bring you glory. God, we praise you and thank you for every prodigal. God, we know angels are rejoicing and we're rejoicing with them. And God, we pray for everyone who lifted their hand or put in the chat, drifting no more from me. God, oh, I lift them up to you. Holy Spirit, strengthen them right where they are. Refresh them right where they are. Draw them back to their first love. And remind them of who you are and who they are in you. And God, begin a work in them that without question is all you. God, we thank you for finishing that which you started. And God, we praise you for the victory. God, I declare a renewal in every one of our lives today. Everyone watching and everyone in attendance. As we commit to avoid the suffering and choose to seek you in it. And to soar through it by faith, through the power that can only come from you. Thank you, God, for speaking to us today and reminding us to follow in your footsteps. We're not Jesus fans, we're Jesus followers. Amen. And today your text, God, demonstrated how we walk it out. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we honor you. And we worship you because you alone are worthy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.